For just $2.99 a month, you can help the Murder Diaries podcast more than you already do by being a valued listener. In return, you get to listen ad-free. So head over to patreon.com slash the Murder Diaries pod or search the Murder Diaries ad-free on Spotify. You can also subscribe on Apple Podcast. Again, $2.99 and you get to listen ad-free. Welcome back to another episode of the Murder Diaries. I'm Paige. And I'm Natalie. In February of 2008, 24-year-old Lindsay Buziak was entering the prime of her career. She was becoming well-known throughout Saanich, British Columbia for being one of the youngest, hardest-working real estate agents. Lindsay was surprised when she received a cold call from someone looking for a million-dollar home, but was looking forward to possibly making a big sale. She made an appointment to show the clients a beautiful home. Shortly after she entered the house with the clients, her boyfriend found her dead inside the primary bedroom. Despite the viciousness of her murder, Lindsay's case remains unsolved. This is her story. You still think it's in my head, but I'm walking with the dead. Lindsay Elizabeth Buziak was born November 2nd, 1983 to Jeff and Evelyn Buziak in Victoria, British Columbia. Three years later, she was joined by her younger sister, Sarah. Her father, Jeff, was a real estate agent and Evelyn was a stay-at-home mother. In an interview with Capital Daily, Evelyn described her oldest daughter as such a happy little thing. She was smart. She was full of joy. Evelyn went on to describe how little Lindsay was outgoing and loved to make friends, but could also be a bit timid. Lindsay was silly, and one time she even asked her mother to buy her some grape bubblegum because it matched her purple dress. Lindsay's love for fashion continued to grow as she entered her teenage years. Evelyn said that she would always buy her daughter what she needed, but not always wanted, which led Lindsay to getting her first job at Sirens, a clothing store in the Mayfair Mall. The family of four often spent their summers in Lake Cowichan. Sarah, Lindsay's younger sister, recalled to Capital Daily how much she always wanted to do what her big sister was doing. Lindsay spent the summer swimming, so Sarah had to learn to swim. Both Sarah and Evelyn remember how kind Lindsay was, even at a young age. One time, she even stood up for another boy being picked on at school. It was in Lindsay's nature to care for others and be an advocate for those who couldn't. When Lindsay and Sarah were still young, their parents divorced. Evelyn was awarded custody of the girls. In the early 2000s, Jeff moved to Calgary, Alberta, continuing to work as a commercial real estate agent. Following in her father's footsteps, Lindsay began to focus on a career in real estate. She began attending the Real Estate Trading Services Program at the University of British Columbia Sauter School of Business. Lindsay successfully passed her real estate exam in June of 2006. She was actually one of just 20 real estate agents under the age of 25 in the greater Victoria area. She started working at Maverick, a real estate agency which was selling townhouses in West Shore. Lindsay was just getting out of a long-term relationship when she ran into Jason, who Lindsay had met a few other times. He just so happened to be a semi-professional hockey player. Lindsay's friend Vicky said that Lindsay was really impressed with Jason and his family. Vicky told Capital Daily that Lindsay really looked up to the fact that Jason was in the real estate industry, and his mom was too. It seemed like she was happy with his mom and excited to be part of their circle. In early 2007, Jason's mother Shirley bought a home on Shawnigan Lake. Jason and Lindsay spent the entire summer living in the basement and had the run of the rest of the house when it wasn't being occupied by family. Eventually, the couple moved into a one-bedroom condo in the Inner Harbor, which was owned by Jason's family. Lindsay soon began working for the same brokerage company, a branch of Remax, that Jason and his mother worked for. It wasn't long before Lindsay had proven that she was great at her job, helping out with several property sales, grossing a total of $3.2 million in the company. In the small town of Saanich, British Columbia, Lindsay quickly became known as one of the most ambitious, hardest-working real estate agents around, despite being one of the youngest. Sarah said that her sister was incredibly happy with how her career was going, telling True Crime Daily that getting into real estate was a big thing for her. She loved it. Maria, who was one of Lindsay's best friends, described her to Capital Daily as literally the most vivacious person you've ever met in your life. Lindsay's determination and enthusiasm was unmatched, and those who loved her knew that she was destined for greatness. In fact, Maria said that Lindsay was the definition of a boss babe before that was even anything. 
On Friday, February 1st, 2008, Lindsay received a phone call on her cell phone from a woman in a very heavy accent. Lindsay later described the accent as possibly being from someone of Spanish or Mexican descent. The caller told Lindsay that her husband was being transferred from Vancouver to Victoria and that they were looking for a newly built million-dollar home. She asked if Lindsay could meet her around 5.30 p.m. the following day and show her and her husband some houses so that they could make a purchase. Lindsay found the call a bit odd. She had no seven-figure listings at the time, and the woman had called her cell phone. When she'd asked the woman how she got her information, the woman said that she'd been referred by one of Lindsay's former clients. Lindsay made notes during this phone call. One million. New. Three bedroom, three bath. Large primary bedroom. Housekeeper. Separate area for housekeeper. 15 to 20 minutes. And needs to buy in two days. The time 5.30 was circled at the bottom of the page, just above the phone number of the caller. Despite the weird feelings that Lindsay got about the call, she was really excited. After all, she wanted to get into high-end luxury real estate with the hopes of being able to eventually take care of her mom and dad. It should be no surprise that making a sale like this would open a lot of doors for Lindsay's career. Jason's mother, Shirley, came over to the condo to meet Lindsay for dinner and heard the end of that phone conversation, but she didn't notice anything strange. After the call, Lindsay continued on with her evening, having dinner with Shirley while Jason was at hockey practice. Shirley actually even offered to do the showing for Lindsay so she could attend a previously planned bachelorette party for a friend in Vancouver. But it seemed as though Lindsay was planning on meeting her friends after the showing. Jason returned to the couple's condo around midnight. He later described Lindsay's concern around the showing as more curiosity than fear. She didn't understand why the caller had reached out to her for such a large sale. She was still a pretty new agent and didn't have a significant amount of experience. Jason said that he also offered to do the showing for Lindsay so she could go to Vancouver, but she declined his offer. The following day, Saturday, February 2nd, Jason said that the same caller called their home phone to ask for Lindsay. He said that she wasn't home, but offered to give her Lindsay's cell. The woman who Jason described as having a broken Spanish accent said that she already had her cell phone number. Lindsay reportedly called the client who had allegedly referred these clients that she'd be showing that house to, but they denied knowing who this client was. That afternoon, Lindsay was at the Remax office and asked the two receptionists to search the caller's name and phone number in the Remax database. They were unable to find anything. One of Lindsay's colleagues said that he'd overheard her telling other coworkers about the client and showing. Several co-workers offered to accompany Lindsay to the showing, but she said that her boyfriend Jason was meeting her there. Late that afternoon, Lindsay and Jason met for lunch at a restaurant near their condo. They paid out at 4.24 p.m. and left in separate vehicles. Lindsay's father later told Still a Mystery that Jason was supposed to be meeting Lindsay at the home she was showing at 5.30. The house at 1702 to Sousa Place in Gordon Head was one of four homes on a cul-de-sac. The beautiful home was not one of Lindsay's listings, but she was still able to show it. It comforted Jeff that Jason would be with his daughter at the showing. Jason, after all, was 6'3", 240 pounds, and again, a semi-pro athlete. Jeff felt confident that he could protect his daughter. After lunch, Jason stopped by an auto shop to visit a friend and lost track of time. He texted Lindsay at 5.29 p.m. to tell her that he was on his way to the Gordon Head house. She responded that she'd see him soon. Some reports say that Jason called Lindsay for directions because the address wasn't showing up on his GPS. These reports also say that Lindsay answered and was about to give directions when she said that the clients were there and she had to go. At 5.29 p.m., Lindsay accessed the digital lockbox at the house to retrieve the keys. Witnesses later told detectives that they saw two people standing outside with Lindsay. Presumably, this would be the caller and her husband. At 5.38 p.m., Jason texted Lindsay again, letting her know that he was just a few minutes away, but he got no response. At 5.45 p.m., Jason, accompanied by his friend Cohen, pulled into the cul-de-sac. They saw the front door of the house open and then close quickly. It looked like people were walking out of the home, then quickly changed their mind. Jason assumed that Lindsay was still showing the house, so he pulled up and parked. He and Cohen waited for 10 minutes in front of the home, then moved to another street and waited another 10 minutes. He still hadn't received any response from Lindsay to his texts or calls. Just after 6 p.m., Jason was concerned that he still hadn't heard back from her. Though he said she'd asked him to hang back so the clients didn't know he was there, he was worried not being able to get in touch with her. Jason and Cohen approached the house, but found the door locked. 
This was odd since the front door was typically left open during showings. He rang the doorbell several times, but no one came to the door. Jason got in touch with the listing agent who gave him the garage code, but it wouldn't work. When he looked in through the windows by the front door, Jason saw Lindsay's shoes in the foyer, a pair of black heels laying haphazardlessly on the floor. Jason decided then to call 911 to explain the situation and that he was worried that he couldn't get in contact with her from inside the house. Cohen made his way to a patio around the back of the home. A wooden fence surrounded the patio, but there was a set of open French doors just inside the fence. Jason helped Cohen over the fence, then ran back around the house. Cohen unlocked the front door, and Jason ran inside up the stairs and into the primary bedroom suite. Inside, he found a horrific scene. 24-year-old Lindsay was lying on the floor in a pool of her own blood. She had multiple stab wounds, and her throat was slit so severely that she was almost decapitated. As Jason attempted CPR fruitlessly, Cohen called 911, but it was too late. Lindsay was gone. Jason later told Capital Daily that he still thinks about the what-ifs. He said, I think about it all the time. If I was 10 minutes earlier, if I went with her, would she still be alive? Lindsay's family was devastated and probably confused. Lindsay made friends with everyone and didn't have any enemies. Her father described her as a shining star. He said she always made people around her feel at ease. Why would someone hurt her, let alone brutally murder her? It was clear to investigating detectives that figuring out who these clients were that Lindsay was meeting that day would be the key to figuring out exactly what and why she was dead. Several witnesses on the cul-de-sac reported having seen Lindsay standing outside of the Gordon Head house with a man and a woman. The description of the man was pretty general. He was described as a Caucasian male between 30 and 40 years old, about six feet tall with dark hair, wearing a long jacket. The female was also described as Caucasian between the ages of 35 and 40 with short blonde hair. She was reportedly wearing a very distinct dress, which had a black, red, and white swirl pattern. Witnesses gave enough information that they were able to create a sketch of her to distribute. Though investigators were initially hopeful that they could identify this woman from her dress, Staff Sergeant Chris Horsley said that they were unable to. He told True Crime Daily, We think we may have even found the exact brand of dress. It wasn't a designer high-end name brand, unfortunately. It was something that could be commonly bought in the department store. So, unfortunately, the dress didn't pan out for us. Unfortunately, none of the witnesses actually saw the clients leaving the house. Detectives believed that they had left through the back doors after seeing Jason's vehicle pull up out front. Sergeant Horsley explained how tight the timeline was for the attack. Quote, the killers were actually about to walk out of the front door and leave, and he turned onto the cul-de-sac and interrupted them leaving. If he had been five seconds later, he would have driven right into the suspects walking out here into the driveway. Detectives were unfortunately able to get much evidence from the scene. Despite the brutality of the crime, they couldn't recover enough DNA evidence to ID the murderers. It appeared as though the murder had been planned and carefully executed. It was also possible that the murderers might have cleaned up the scene before fleeing. Lindsay's cell phone, wallet, and purse were left at the scene, and it was determined that Lindsay was not sexually assaulted. Sergeant Horsley told True Crime Daily that based on the evidence found at the scene, they were able to create a working theory of what happened— they theorized that Lindsay showed the clients the downstairs first, then brought them upstairs. Quote, when they went upstairs, there was a primary bedroom and an ensuite bathroom. We know that when Lindsay turned to show the ensuite bathroom, she was then attacked from the rear. There's no defensive wounds whatsoever. We don't believe she had any pre-indication that something was amiss. They were able to determine that Lindsay was likely attacked between 5.38 and 5.41 p.m. Her BlackBerry made what seemed to be a pocket dial, leaving a voicemail for a contact that she hadn't spoken to in a while. That voicemail was just muffled noise. Sergeant Horsley spoke about that phone call, saying, We believe that was actually at the point of attack. When the couple attacked Lindsay, somehow it hit buttons on the BlackBerry and sent out a phone call. The only tangible clue that detectives had was the phone number written in Lindsay's date book. It was traced to a prepaid cell phone that was purchased in a convenience store in Vancouver by someone using a fake name, Paolo Rodriguez, and an address. 
It was found to have been activated for the first time just before the client first called Lindsay. The day before Lindsay was murdered, the phone had traveled from Vancouver to Saanich via ferry. The phone was never activated again after Lindsay's murder. Because of this, it seemed as though detectives most promising lead turned into a dead end. And with nothing concrete to go on, they began looking into those closest to her. This episode is brought to you in part by Shopify. You guys have heard us talk about Shopify a million times already. And that sound you heard at the beginning, you already knew that it was the sound of another sale on your online Shopify store. But remember, Shopify can also help you sell in person. It's so easy to connect customers in line and online. Shopify POS is your command center for your retail store. From accepting payments to managing inventory, Shopify has everything you need to sell in person. With Shopify, you get a powerhouse selling partner that effortlessly unites your in-person and online sales into one source of truth. Track everything sales across your business in one place and know exactly what's in stock. Shopify helps you drive store traffic with plug and play tools built for marketing campaigns from TikTok to Instagram and beyond. Get hardware that fits your business. Take payments by smartphone, transform your tablet into a point of sale system, or use Shopify's POS Go mobile device for a battle-tested solution. Plus, Shopify's award-winning help is there to support your success every step of the way. Do retail right with Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash murder diaries, all lowercase shopify.com slash murder diaries to take your retail business to the next level today shopify.com slash murder diaries now let's talk about the suspects jason was an obvious person for detectives to speak to about Lindsay's murder her family was immediately suspicious of his actions and his demeanor following the murder He was questioned after the murder, and he even agreed to show detectives his exact steps as he discovered Lindsay. This revisit of his steps was filmed in the very house that Lindsay was murdered in. In the recording, Jason shows detectives how Cohen had come through the house and unlocked the door. Jason said that as soon as he was inside the house, he began yelling Lindsay's name as he rushed upstairs immediately. He said that it only took him about two seconds to get up the stairs. Some of Lindsay's loved ones who watched this recording were concerned about how calm Jason seemed in the video. They felt like it was just a few days after her murder and they were back in the same house that Jason should have appeared more upset. They also didn't understand why Jason waited before going inside and why he moved his car to another street. Security footage showed Jason and his friend leaving the auto body shop around 5.30 p.m., the same time that witnesses saw Lindsay and the clients at the Gordon Head house. It just didn't make sense to them. Jeff, Lindsay's father, said that Jason didn't show any outward signs of grief, which was confusing to him. However, Sarah, Lindsay's sister, said that Jason was hurt, confused, and sad. Sarah also later told True Crime Daily that she had no issues with Jason. She spoke highly of Lindsay and Jason's relationship, saying she was with Jason at the time, and I knew that she was extremely happy. I absolutely adored him. Jeff didn't feel the same way. He told True Crime Daily that Jason adored Lindsay, but he was overprotective, overpossessive, and that really bothered Lindsay. Jeff added that when Lindsay came to visit him a few months prior to her murder, she told him that she and Jason were having issues. Quote, she just felt Jason was overbearing and demanding and, you know, jealous, possessive. She came out to Calgary to speak to me about that. While detectives said the evidence supported Jason's chronicle of events, Jeff told True Crime Daily that he still has questions about that day. Quote, there's certain things I don't buy there. For me personally, one, I would have gone and checked as soon as I saw somebody dart in and out of the front door. That concerns me. The other thing that's odd to me is supposedly Jason had never been to the house. Why would he push the front door open, run up the stairwell right into the primary bedroom without stopping? Jason agreed to take a polygraph, which he passed, and denied having anything to do with his girlfriend's murder. He told Capital Daily that he thought investigators wasted time questioning him and his friend after Lindsay was discovered. He said, it made me so mad. What they should have been doing is having 8, 10, 12 cars searching right away. I think that they totally botched the whole investigation on the first day. It was obvious from the severity of the attack that the murder was personal. 
One of the homicide detectives on Lindsay's case said it felt like it was a result of pent-up rage, something he often saw in domestic situations. There was no evidence connecting Jason to Lindsay's murder, and he was clear to detectives. It is important to again note here that there was no evidence connecting Jason to Lindsay's murder, and he was cleared by detectives. Sergeant Horsley believes that Jason was fully investigated. He told True Crime Daily, based on forensic evidence, timeline of communications, witness testimony, video surveillance, we know he's not the killer. Was he perhaps somehow involved in the planning? Well, he successfully passed a polygraph and he successfully took part in all these interviews with us. So at this point in time, he's not considered a suspect. As investigators continued to look into Lindsay's life and maybe find anything that could have led to her murder, they found that she had a strange connection. In December of 2007, just two months before Lindsay was murdered, she went to visit her father in Calgary. When looking through Lindsay's social media, detectives found that she made contact with someone she knew that was later arrested for his involvement in a major drug ring. The individual had been in possession of a large amount of cocaine. Sergeant Horsley explained, we don't know the nature of the call, we don't know why she called him, and we don't know why she was on his Facebook. Detectives theorized that Lindsay might have seen something she wasn't supposed to and had been murdered because of it. Sergeant Horsley elaborated on how significant the drug bust was and how angry people were about law enforcement making the arrests. What we can say is people lost a lot of money and the people that lost drugs know that someone had spoken to the police. A witch hunt occurred where people were being questioned. People were being pulled out of their beds in the middle of the night and asked, who have you spoken to? Because they know someone spoke to the police. Using a burner cell phone like the ones that the, quote, clients contacted Lindsay on was a standard operation for drug traffickers, as was the violent nature of the murder. Though this seemed like it was a definite possibility, Lindsay's friends and family didn't believe it. Her father said that all she did was look the person up on Facebook and try his number once, that there was no way she could be mistaken for being involved. Lindsay's best friend, Maria, said that she had many friends who recreationally used drugs, but Lindsay never did. Detective Sergeant Horsley reported on February of 2011 that they looked through every inch of Lindsay's life. He said, there's nothing in her life, and we've conducted an extensive background that would indicate that she was involved in anything criminal and anything of a domestic violence relationship, and that is the most perplexing thing. It is also possible Lindsay's killers were under the mistaken impression that she had revealed information she shouldn't have, or perhaps that she was somehow connected to a dangerous person without knowing it. You can be a person who just works and minds their own business in Victoria, yet through a very brief network of friends, you could be absolutely connected to people that were involved in very bad things. During detective search of Lindsay's social media, they noticed some other strange things. They obtained her Toshiba laptop from Jason and found that there were missing chat messages. From January 4th, 2008 to February 3rd, 2008, just a day after Lindsay's murder, there were no messages or posts on her Facebook page from any of her 700 friends. Compared to her typical social media activity, this seemed very abnormal. There were other theories as well, several including the drug cartel possibly being involved in Lindsay's murder. However, there wasn't any direct evidence that investigators could use to tie someone specifically to the murder. The lack of progression in her case frustrated her family. And unfortunately, as more time went on, misinformation began to spread through the internet, with some of it even allegedly coming from those closest to Lindsay. Though the majority of details in Lindsay's case were known to the public, this didn't stop false information from spreading. Retired Royal Canadian Mountain Police homicide detective and forensic coroner Gary Rogers created a blog post in 2019 outlining the false information that had been published and continuously distributed about Lindsay's murder. During his research into Lindsay's case, Gary reported that he had spoken directly with law enforcement, Lindsay's family and friends, and others in Lindsay's life. He directly contradicts the widely publicized belief that Lindsay asked Jason to come meet her at the Gordon Head house because she was frightened. He wrote, The fear, rumor, and speculation is non-factual and misleading. Lindsay didn't want anyone helping or guarding her, and there were no red flags alarming anyone, including Lindsay. She was just an independent young woman who wanted to establish a professional and competent reputation in the community, and she did not want anyone hovering over her. 
Gary alleges that Jason simply went to the Gordon Head house that evening to drop off some documents about another real estate deal that both he and Lindsay were involved in, and there was a sensitive timeline. He wrote, the real reason Jason went to the house had nothing to do with security or fear for her welfare. Jason went to the house because he had papers for a real estate deal that he and Lindsay were brokering. The vendor who had retained Jason to list his condo was at the auto detailing shop. Lindsay was representing a purchaser who had made an offer on the condo. When Jason went to the shop, the vendor made a counter offer that required Lindsay to present to the purchaser. Quote, quite simply, Jason had to give the realty papers to Lindsay so she could get the purchaser to accept, reject, or make another counter offer. Jason waited outside because he did not want to barge into a showing Lindsay had underway. He couldn't leave the papers in Lindsay's vehicles because it was locked, and he couldn't leave them outside because of the cold, damp February weather. Once time dragged on and he couldn't contact Lindsay by phone, he naturally became more concerned and contacted the authorities, then entered the house. If it weren't for the counteroffer, Jason would never have been at the house. Though Gary is confident that all of the allegations against Jason and his family are wrong, he does agree that Lindsay's murder was purposeful and carefully planned. He explains in his blog that someone had to give the clients Lindsay's cell phone number, and that person knew a lot about Lindsay. Gary wrote, the person knew Lindsay was young, inexperienced, hungry, and would risk showing a shaky sale, and someone inside the real estate community knew the property was the perfect scene to carry out a controlled killing. They knew the murder scene address, they knew the price, they knew the condition. They knew there was a suitable nanny suite, and they knew the floor plan. They knew there was a real tree entry bypass. That person knew exactly what was inputted into the Remax listing database. This encourages the belief that the caller gave Lindsay a list of specific demands for a reason, that they were aware that those demands would line up with one listing, the Gordon Head House. Gary also wrote about someone who he strongly believes is involved in Lindsay's murder. The woman was a good friend of Lindsay's and worked with her in the Remax office. She was the person who input the information into the computer for the Gordon Head house. Strangely enough, she reportedly quit Remax the day following Lindsay's murder. Allegedly, this woman has been very uncooperative with police, and Gary calls her a prime person of interest and the link who will come forward and tell the truth. Additionally, while many publications reported that Lindsay was stabbed about 40 times and her throat slit, Gary said that this is incorrect and that his source reported that she was stabbed between 10 and 15 times. Lindsay's autopsy, which would be able to confirm how many stab wounds she endured, has not been made public. It's incredibly unfortunate that so many details in Lindsay's case have morphed into possible inaccurate information online. This is something that we see often in true crime coverage. And it would surprise you that it often happens with reputable news outlets. But for Lindsay's case in particular, there are many accusations that someone very close to Lindsay has encouraged this misspread of information. However, it doesn't change the fact that Lindsay's murder remains unsolved. Jeff Buziak continues to fight for answers and justice for Lindsay. Each year, he leads a walk from Saanich Municipal Hall to the British Columbia Legislature to remind authorities that they are still waiting for answers. Jeff told Black Press Media, unfortunately, the country, Province and Sandwich are letting everybody down. My daughter was murdered. The killers are walking free in the community and women are scared. That's the reality. They haven't been serious enough about it. They haven't handled procedures properly and they just don't have the experience to do it. The Sandwich police say that Lindsay's homicide is still an open and active investigation, despite the fact that the Buziaks say the officials don't tell them anything. Inspector Damian Kalowich told Victoria News, We recognize and acknowledge the emotional toll this has had on Lindsay's family and friends and continue to pursue justice for Lindsay. Jeff is determined to keep Lindsay's case in the limelight and keep her name in the minds of law enforcement by doing the annual Lindsay Buziak Walk for Justice. He told Victoria News, until there are arrests made, I will continue walking. That's it for this week's episode. Be sure to follow us on socials at The Murder Diaries Pod. We're everywhere. And until next week, Stay safe. Bye. Bye. Seeking the truth never gets old. Introducing June's Journey, the free-to-play mobile game that will immerse you in a thrilling murder mystery. Join June Parker as she uncovers hidden objects and clues to solve her sister's death 
in a beautifully illustrated world set in the Roaring Twenties. With new chapters added every week, the excitement never ends. Download June's Journey now on your Android or iOS device, or play on PC through Facebook games.